Hey, hi there, it's Polly here. Ooh. <laughs> Cuticorn juice time, yay. So, um, I want to talk to you about some of um, Modophius's offerings. So, a while ago, Modophius did a Kickstarter for a John Carter of Mars role playing game. Now, uh, I absolutely adore the sword and planet genre because it is stupid. Uh, I love it. It's silly, it's fun, it's ridiculous. For some reason, it's ray guns and sabers. Um, it's um, mighty flying skiffs and um, um, sailing ships, but no one seems to have, you know, figured out how to use nuclear missiles. But it's a fantastic environment. It was one of the first real science fiction genres, and I'm, I'm really happy to see it alive today. Now, Modophius uh, do, I mean, spectacular jobs because they raise spectacular amounts of money. Um, however, this is actually good game design and it's a good job. So, look. John Carter of Mars. It's Modovius. The base set comes in a um, way cool um, slip box and um, and uh, inside that we've got two volumes. So essentially you've got the rules, Adventuring on Barsoom, but they also give you a campaign. A hardcover campaign comes you know, with that slipcover set. Uh, and in addition to that you get like you know DM's toolkit and a very cool um, um, gem screen with the expected bits and pieces of uh, charts and so on on it. But, okay, so um, the John Carter of Mars setting. So this is written in the early 1900s and um, it's written by the author that created Tarzan. It's got a lot of that um, sword swinging, swashbuckling, daring do that was very popular in kind of historical fantasies at the time. But it has a, an interesting breadth of imagination. Now the science of course is <laughs> completely screwed. This is 1913 understanding of science and it's fabulous. So um, a trope of the genre is that every single planet in the solar system for some reason is habitable and if it's habitable it tends to have people of some kind on it. So yes you can um, you can adventure on Venus, you can adventure on Mars, you can wander Mercury and um, hell you can wander Jupiter! Um, yay team! Um, they, they knew what they knew but on that basis this is fabulous. So the John Carter of Mars novel series was fantastic and it built this this world they are rip-roaring adventures, make very little sense, and they're screamingly good fun. For those of you who don't really know the setting, so um, concurrent with our own time and civilization, there is life on Mars, which is of course called Basum, and in their language, you know, Earth is Jasum. Uh, there once was a titanic civilization on the planet, which was very high-tech. Uh, and it has withered. Their environment is indeed buggered. Um, so waters have disappeared, it's dried up. What once were seas are now mighty sort of desert basins and plateaus. They have some huge machines which were kind of left by the dying science of their old world. And this kind of melts water out of the polar ice caps and sends them down canals and so on. And this, is, this allows cities to exist. Um, and it also generates air because the air um, hasn't been, uh, um, there's just not enough vegetation to keep it going. So these giant plants that keep the air going. Uh, however, the um, surface itself, a lot of it has barbaric cultures of um, natives on it. Uh, beautiful giant four-armed um, 15 foot tall guys uh, who are the green Martians and they tend to have a barbaric culture and they often live in the ruins of old Martian cities. There are the red Martians and um, they are um, civilized, they have cities, they make airships etc etc, um, you know income tax and poetry. And there are also some little survivor populations of minority races, some of whom were and remain quite high tech. So the gravity there is lower. People that are born there just kind of act like everyday humans, but if humans from Earth get there, uh, then you can sort of jump higher, you are stronger. You can't jump skyscraper levels, but you can at least jump over the heads of like other swordsmen or um, you know bounce your way merrily across terrain in a very silly running jump um, until you fall over. Great fun. So 
the technology level that the cities have um they have radium rifles uh and uh, radium pistols these are um they work off mm -hmm, and they project bullets that have like a little glass tube of radium in them and if that cracks and hits sunlight not any other kind of light only sunlight it explodes Oh, so at night time, um, bullets fly everywhere, but you've got to get out of the area in the morning because if there's lots of cracked bullets lying around a battlefield, as the sun comes up, they go off everywhere. Okay. Um, and lances and swords and short swords and daggers. And they have a um, everyone, even the barbarians, um, everyone, even the worst bad guys in the cosmos, they have an honor code. You can only kind of respond to someone with the same weapon that they've pulled on you, or lesser. So if someone draws a sword, you can't draw a revolver. Um, you've got to face them down with a sword or a short sword or a dagger or something. If they draw a dagger, you can't respond by drawing a long sword. You've got to come at them ah, barehanded or daggers. Um, except in outright battle, wars, in which case those rules are kind of off, except for, you know, mighty mano e mano meets. They have... Um, power generation they do have some interesting things like in the books some of their farmsteads are on kind of big pistons which raise up uh, above the ground at night to stop monsters wandering in because there's lots of monsters wandering around um, they also have um, aircraft and these are wonderful and uh, the, I'll, I will love the explanation of this till till my dying day they have the ability to send up to set up mighty prisms and it splits light into more than just the seven rays that we know on Earth. There are the eighth and ninth Barsoomian rays. And um, one of these extra rays is separated off, mixed with certain elements of electricity, and then pumped into holding tanks. So I love the thought that this has now become liquid. And that is basically... See, they knew, <laughs> they knew that light was somehow kind of particles, but this is the bit that makes the particles go. This is what makes light travel. So you've separated that off and you've pumped it into tanks, and then you can kind of use it to make things go. So if you've got tanks of this, it makes your ships float. Um, but, ah, if your ship is hit, oh no, it can bleed light. So, ah, she's going down. Um, in which case you have to put on your um, safety vest, which has um, um, little capsules of light in it and we jump off an abandoned ship and then you let, let some of the light out so you can float down and um yes there's like n uh an other Barsoomian rays that are used for power and so on but uh so it's it's delicious the science is fantastic this is a swashbuckling environment now what i quite like the designers have done obviously written in 1913 it's got some sort of inherent sexism although wackily enough not inherent racism not really the red martians rule basum but the green martians who are our barbaric culture they are not horrible because they are green they it's it's nurture not nature they're horrible because their culture only lets them act in a certain way but very early on john carter sort of proves that when you befriend these guys or whatever there are some of them that have great qualities and you can change those societies and show them, you know, different values and whatever. Um, so they don't have to be wandering around constantly, like, you know, murdering everybody and cannibalizing everything. There's, if you give them resources and show them how to use things and whatever, they can, you know, um, they can kind of let that aspect of their culture slide. There are some absolute rotters kind of hidden there. We don't want to give too many giveaways. Some of these small survivor populations are absolute rotters but again there's great people in them and they can sort of turn their society around they've got a, a horrible leader that has sort of convinced them to be you know rotten fascists etc but you can you can find the good folk in the uh, culture and overthrow it which is a big thing that happens in the games with that in mind we've had to have a game design that can handle those big things as well as you know yahoo daring do and swashbuckling so the overall system um Madovis have a great system. 2D20, they've modified this slightly to suit the um, the game and the environment. So, in essence, um, how the 2D20 system works is you'll be given characteristics and you'll roll two 20-sided dice. If those dice come up under the two characteristics that are attached to that particular skill test, it's a success. If it comes up as under the lowest of the two characteristics, it's extra successes. 
If it's a straight contest between two people, whoever gets the most successes wins. For other things, you might have a minimum number of successes required in order to um, actually you know, get a result. But there's a very nice pair of systems. There's luck and there's momentum. So luck. Everyone gets luck points and you can spend these luck points to influence your rolls. You can get essentially an extra dice, but that dice is counted as having rolled a one. So it will always, unless you've got like a level one characteristic, it'll always get you the extra successes. So what you can do is, essentially if you roll a 20 on those dice, that's um, you know, a fumble or rather it's a, it's a negative result. A complication appears, a piece of equipment breaks, something happens. So for instance, if you only needed like a couple of successes to, to get by something, you can rely on luck. You say, I'm gonna burn a luck point, counts as rolling one, and I'm not actually physically rolling any dice, so you don't risk you know, having a loss. Nice idea. And you can use it to your up damage, lower damage on yourself, make it that lucky shot hit, etc. by, you know, having those extra dice. Uh, they also have a really clever system called Momentum. Now, given that way of rolling successes, if you have had a character roll more successes than it needs to succeed, you can sometimes burn the excess, like in uh, combat you can use it for extra damage and so on. But the other thing you do is you save it for Momentum. Uh, and this can be uh, kept track of you know, on paper or with counters or coins or whatever. Characters can then use the momentum and this gets them all kinds of um, extra things. So in combat, for instance, you can act, you can get an extra combat action. If someone attacks you and you roll a parry, if you've already had your attack, you can say I'm doing a counterattack. Or you can interrupt the flow and take your turn or an extra turn. You can get bonuses to dice rolls. You can turn... Um, little extra bits of narrative to your advantage. You can discuss, I'm spending this to try and have us find that lucky object. I'm locked in a cell. All right, well, one of the other prisoners is a guy that I've known, so I've got an ally in here. Or, you know, you can you can do these sorts of little things. Um, but the kind of impetus behind these things is you have to sort of use them or they wither. At the end of a, like, a scene, your pool of safe momentum will reduce by one. Um, in a combat, you have like a, a turn which is filled with many combat rounds. Everyone gets everyone gets their go. But at the end of that turn where everyone gets their go, your saved momentum lowers by one. So what I quite like about this is if you've got a um, if you've got a scenario where someone's got to say, for instance, sneak into a town, uh, dress up as one of the guards, talk their way past some people, finagle their way through some you know, locks and some traps to get in to find the, um, the ultimate bad guy. You've got a chance there to gather some momentum and then, ha ha, when you cross blade to the ultimate mad, bad guy, you've got some momentum. But you've kind of got to use that and use that fairly quickly. So decisive action becomes really important when you've taken the narrative to that point. Because um, if you save that hoping to use it in like much later combat turns, it'll have started to wither away. You wouldn't have got full value. So in other words, you know, fling yourself in, um, do that thing, smash that bad guy. Um, the umpire has his own version of momentum, which is used for the bad guys. So as people use some of their momentum or luck, or sometimes if they just kind of wish to make a reroll, you can do it, but the umpire, he gets um, points that he can use in the same style as momentum, but they're just for um, affecting the villain characters. So you can start saving up stuff to use against the player characters, which is like really rather cool. Um, and again, you can get tactics where player characters try and burn this off them by making them come after them by putting obstacles in their path um, you can whittle that down before it gets to a final conflict. Um, these points can also be used to inflict complications on the player characters. So you know, things are not as simple as they seem. <sighs> they're trying to sneak in somewhere, but now they're recognized by someone that they've seen before, etc., etc. So there's a lot of give and take in the system. It's, it's a very uh, pretty system, but it works really nicely melodramatically, which is you know, what it's designed for. So um, absolute full points for that design. Um, I really like the uh, characteristics in this. It doesn't care about your dexterity. It doesn't care about your um, um, 
uh, incredible magical powers and so on, um, it's kept more track of physical things. So, oh, sorry, of sort of emotional things. So, it's interested in your passion. Um, it's interested in your daring. Um, it is interested in your might. Um, but um, these tend to be more kind of your emotional landscape for the character, which is really, really nice. So, when you get a character, uh, and you're going to make one for the game. You can decide whether you're coming from one of the native cultures. You can decide to be from off-world. Um, these all get you different things. If you're from off-world, you're not used to their technologies. You have to learn these in play. So you can't just fly these ships, etc. There's a nice little system where it tells you if you're coming from this culture, it gives you a list of what you know. And it also gives you a list of what you can do. This is not a game that has classes, but it also isn't really a skill run game. You don't. You just can do the things you're expected to do. A Red Martian can pilot ships and can use swords and can shoot and um, can do some of their technological stuff. Um, but a Green Martian cannot pilot ships because they're from a more primitive culture. They can do blades, they can shoot, they can look after their riding beasts and they're really good at kind of tracking and so on, which the Red Martians obviously aren't because they're sort of townsfolk. What you get is you purchase um, traits for yourself. So as you design the character, you choose where you're from, you decide those basic um, landscape characteristics, which you can you know, massage to yourself, or you can choose archetypes that they've got in there. You choose flaws. You get character flaws for yourself, which are often things designed to get you more into the action. You know, it's like, oh, you're hot-blooded. Yes, as soon as you see an injustice, you're going to fling yourself in. Um, these kinds of things are all put in there. But you, you get traits, and the traits are, have multiple layers of ability within them you initially get a few traits and you gain these with experience as you go on and these are the things that kind of attribute to skills so as a trait you might have a thing where normally um, perception and so on are used for um, um, some skills you might be able to substitute your intellect for them you might be able to do that for swordsmanship you know instead of how mighty you are being a core skill it's how smart you are you're a cunning swordsman as these go up in higher levels, they give you a dice bonus on using the skill. So that's where your skills come in. You can be a great pilot. You can do all these different things for like fencing and fighting and tracking, diplomacy. And you can also spend experience on uh, gaining yourself titles and ranks. You gain a thing called renown as you as you do mighty deeds so that people start to respect you more what this does allow you to do is kind of interfere at the higher level um, once you gain titles and you gain that respect of the cultures you start to get the ability to change them so when you've got the respect of those green martians you know you fought beside them you've saved some of them um, you got rid of their evil warlord you know, ah yes you know now you're a jeddak of the martians well you can change the way that that tribe thinks and operates you can change the policies of you know evil cities that have become you know predatory on others so the the, the sandbox of the world becomes yours um, lovely idea they have put in all the all the characters from the books and you can ignore it all and you can ignore all of the um, the actual story from John Carter because he finds some of these survivor groups and you know, he goes to places you can make this your very own sandbox it can just be used yeah, as a general guide your your people come in all of the monsters and so on are in there they're quite easy to do they're well done um, an interesting point is that there's actually no mechanism for killing player characters you take damage and there are different damage tracks as kind of this physical and there's also stress tracks for um, essentially um, mental stuff, confusion and so on, and, and for um, um, exhaustion, fear. So you get different levels of effect happens to you. Some weapons will physically damage you, but they'll also cause fear effects. They're a fearsome weapon or some of them you might... Um, end up terrorized or going into ancient ruins which will essentially attack your mental stress track because they're causing your know, madness from going into these places or they're causing fear and trepidation or they're giving the umpire more of his momentum for his bad guys because you know there is this is a doomed accursed site um, nice idea but when you take physical damage you get negatives to what you do as you accrue it but when it gets to a certain level 
That's it. You swoon, you're out. Boom. You can also elect to just swoon if you've gotten so many <laughs> dice negatives. It's like, oh, I'm getting hammered here. You can just uh, pass out and then you come back. But the thing is, unconsciousness as far as it goes, because it's a, a hokey, fun, old swashbuckler, they don't want you dead. They want you playing. So you've crossed swords with the evil Martian horde, you know, dozens of them overpower you and that's it. You take some, you take a shot, you take some damage. Um, um, oh, last thing you remember is oh, that sword blow that sent you reeling. Sure, as an umpire, you can say, oh, well, they just cut your head off. But they wouldn't. It's not that kind of a setting. Now you wake up and you're down in their cells. Yes, they're going to make you, you know, fight in their hideous gladiatorial arena um, until you suddenly, you know, make friends with the other people who are your actually your rivals, and you find a way of escaping or fight your way past the guards. Or you know, you find yourself in a cart. You're being taken off because they're going to you know, sell you off as a slave. Now's your chance to escape. Or you're just lying out there in the wilderness. And you play your luck points and, you know, your faithful beast has found you and, you know, he, <laughs> he lovingly licks you awake and oh, now you're on the run. So these are more opportunities to um, keep the action going rather than end it. So it's a game that actually does have momentum. It has a uh, has an ongoing push to basically get in there and play. It's not a game that's set there to stack numbers up against you and you know, kill you and do TPK sun parties. Sure, pies could all die. If you're dumb enough to, yes, we trigger off some giant atomic reaction or we all jump off a cliff, of course you die. But the kind of unspoken push on the umpires here is use it to make more story. So this is a storytelling game and it's a really good one. Um, it's well supported. They've got some very beautiful miniatures that came out, sort of, um, I think they're 35 mil. They're very pretty. Um, you don't need them. They're actually very specific about doing theatre of the mind for this. Just maybe some pencil drawings to show everyone where they are. They're very specific. Now, the other thing that they do do is they do handle the sexism from the books. Um, because princesses are like in the books tend to be, um, they're bricks and some of them are geniuses, some of them are scientists, some of them can like, you know, handle themselves a bit. And you do run into female swordsmen and so on. But, you know, there's also the willowy young maidens. <clears throat> who uh, have um, said no, nay, nay to the suitor who then like, you know, snatches them off in his airship and takes them off to ha ha, lock them up until they agree to marry him. Okay, um, and must be rescued. The books have this because this is a trope of its times. What's been kind of nice is that subsequent media handling of this setting has let that gracefully slide. Um, you can put some of that in if you wish, but for those of you who've seen moves and so on, yes, they've done a good job of making proactive female characters and it didn't change the setting a bit. There they are, you know, swordsmen, scientists and so on. And this is what the game's embraced. It just says, carry on, just keep doing that. That has worked beautifully in media and will keep working here. So look, you know, in summary, this is a really, really good game. The game's system handles both swashbuckling battle but also kind of politics and influencing societies and so on really well it abandons niggles of um big long skill lists and so on for these lovely traits that kind of give real flavor to your characters um it's in a fantastic setting now the setting isn't really limiting because it's that sort of sword and planet thing you can actually go forth from Mars and you can go to, you know, Venus and Jupiter and all these other places. John Carter sure did. Um, but you can also make them up for yourself. You can also use this as a framework for making your own kind of sword and planet thing. If you want to have um, adventures on the wonderful world of Titan, or if, you know, you are a big fan of the Prendergast novels or um, some of the other really cool stuff from the genre that's been out there, you can just lift this and just take it and use it. So um, look, well done, Modophius. The artwork and everything in this is beautiful. The production's beautiful. Game design's great. Uh, I think really well done. I think if you were wanting to play... If you had D&D &D players and wanted to give them something that's a little bit more um, out there, you know, they've, they've got all their monsters down pat and, you know, their spells down pat and you want to sort of give them some swashbuckling fun, Sword and Planet's a great environment to throw them into. If you've got science fiction players, they all secretly want to wave swords. They do. Look at the characters from Traveller. They all know Cutlass. Um, yeah, so, you know, 
So this is kind of what they're yearning for. So throw them in. Never mind the science. Pump that liquid electricity. All right. Anyway, have fun. Cheers. <laughs>